Some say we dream in black and white. In 2010, a nation will dream in green and gold. In a heartbeat, Australian football changed forever. World Cup is the holy grail of sport. And now, for the first time since 1930, the World Game will hold its showpiece event in South Africa. Hi, I'm Melanie McLaughlin and welcome to the road to 2010, the Qantas Socceroos journey to the World Cup. With 43 teams competing in Asia for just four automatic qualifying places, the pressure is on. The journey for the Qantas Socceroos begins with a flight to Eindhoven and a friendly against a formidable opponent. World football giants the Netherlands are ranked number four and the signs are ominous for the visitors after just six minutes. Mike drops off for Tula! First chance of the game, buried by the man they call the Hunter and that's why. Brett Holman has a golden opportunity after 37 minutes. Now kill through, Brett Holman, Stecklenburg slow off his line, but he did enough to make the block. That was Australia's best chance of the first half without question. We have to think the, particularly with Kalina's movement... Right on half-time, catastrophe yeah, strikes, and Australia finds an equaliser. Stecklenburg, Martin Atkinson looked towards his assistant, and he will point to the spot and issue a red card to Martin Stecklenburg. I see Josh Kennedy coming in there now. Harry Kuehl scores for Australia. It's one apiece. High drama. But perhaps that goal is no more than Australia deserved. Straight down the middle from Harry Kuehl. For Qantas Socceroos fans, it's music to their ears. With just 14 minutes remaining, a major upset looks likely. Rooks ball, Kennedy's header, goal! Josh Kennedy's fourth strike at international level. And the Socceroos incredibly lead the fourth ranked nation in the world by two goals to one. And that was Matthias and picking him up, actually gets caught square onto the ball. Boy is picking no one up. It's the perfect header, it's the perfect cross. He doesn't go for power on the header. He just flicks it. The Dutch almost snatch a late goal, but are denied by some Schwartz of brilliant. Points. Oh, could have scored and maybe should have scored. It's a corner. I think Schwartz have got a piece of that. There's a great stop. Well, you're talking about the direct route. That's exactly what they did. And I think against a team like the Dutch, no matter what the circumstances, Australia have every right to celebrate, and they intend to do just that, the Green and Gold Army. As victory is confirmed for the first time against the Dutch at any level. And just a second defeat in 13 years for the Netherlands at this stadium. Pimperbeek puts one over his mate Bert van Marbeek and one over the country of his birth. A real morale boost for Australia, a crushing disappointment for the Netherlands. Born in nearby Rotterdam, coach Pimberbeek is delighted with the result after his side fell behind early. I'm very happy with the result, of course, but I'm uh, more pleased, especially with the first half, the way we played the first half. And uh, Because after five minutes it was 1-0 for Netherlands, and then you think, OK, 85 minutes to go, that can be a tough evening. And I think we recovered very well and created some very good chances, and uh, we deserve to, to score the 1-1. And OK, in the second half it's 11 against 10. It's always a tricky game. But I'm very proud of the boys, good results, very good organised and uh, nobody injured, so cannot be better. It might only be a friendly, but Captain Lucas Neal is acutely aware of what's been achieved. It's amazing. Uh, there's a you know, nice little buzz in the dressing room at the moment. It's always difficult to come to a place like this. Um, technically a very gifted team. But I thought our organisation was excellent tonight. We executed the game plan well and, and probably had the better chances in the game. 
It's the perfect start, but there's little time to celebrate as the journey to South Africa has only just begun. We've got to bring ourselves back down to earth. We've just beat Holland, you know, at home. And we've got to come straight back down now, focus again on a very, very important game. The first in the World Cup uh, qualification on the road to South Africa. And I think um, if we play like we did tonight, I think we're going to give Uzbekistan a very good run for their money. Next stop is Tashkent to begin the fourth and final stage of World Cup qualifying. The Qantas Socceroos face an opponent undefeated in its last 18 home World Cup qualifiers and in a test of the squad's depth, Jason Kalina and Jade North are ruled out prior to kick-off with a stomach bug. Finally, we are underway. After missing the clash against the Netherlands, left-back Scott Chipperfield is the hero, scoring his 12th goal for the national side. Wilkshire's in behind, needs a good delivery, gets one. Chipperfield, it's a goal for Australia. 26 minutes played, the perfect centre, and Scott Chipperfield with the perfect header and the perfect start for the Socceroos. In front of a capacity crowd, the team known as the White Wolves go agonisingly close to equalising. Oh, it was an awkward one for the Australians to deal with and eventually Bakayev fires it over the top of the crossbar. On the stroke of half-time, the Qantas Socceroos almost double their lead. But now Bresciano away, chance perhaps to seal the points for Australia. Bresciano, oh, so close. Oh, he goes for power rather than placement. What a chance made by Kuehl and Holman. So it was a great run before this from Kuehl, but Bresciano bears in on goal. He goes for power. The end of the first half that has been pretty such superb for uh, the Socceroos. Five minutes into the second half, the home side's appeals for a penalty are dismissed. Right to start, though, by Uzbekistan. Now, was there a trip inside the box there? Didn't even think about it, the referee. And under pressure, Wilkshire gives away the corner. Brings the crowd to its feet in Tashkent. Only desperate goal line defence saves Australia three minutes later. Cleared off the line by Luke Wilkshire. Uzbekistan almost snatch a draw in the final tense moments of time added on. Still Uzbekistan have the ball, headed on towards the far post and only centimetres away from making contact. The Qantas Socceroos are ecstatic with three valuable points from its historic first trip to Pactacor Stadium. But there's seven matches remaining and a highly anticipated showdown with Qatar is next on the journey to the World Cup. The World Cup, I'm sure, for those players suddenly feels a little bit closer. The Qantas Socceroos are in a relaxed, jovial mood as they touch down in Brisbane for a crucial Group A clash against top-of-the-table Qatar. Good morning, Brisbane. How you doing, buddy? Hello, Australia. <laughs> Everton superstar Tim Cahill is recognisable around the globe and joins Sheffield United's David Carney for a photo shoot with a group of adoring fans. The team has a surprise waiting for them in the car park. One of the perks for the national side is a personalised set of wheels. Training commences with a light run at Ballymore. After a 3-0 win over Qatar in Melbourne in February and a 3-1 win in Doha in June, the Qantas Socceroos are quick to dismiss talk of complacency leading into the crucial match at Suncorp Stadium. Yeah, good. It's important we don't start complacent. Um, that's always the fear tonight because we've beat them twice, but uh, make sure that doesn't happen. The only thing that can beat us is ourselves and we need to go out there and make sure that um, we break down every barrier that's thrown at us. In one of the biggest matches of the year, the Socceroos are decimated by injuries with Vince Grella and Mark Bresciano unavailable and coach Pimba Bake confirms that the team will be without the biggest star of all, Harry Kuehl. Regarding all the travelling he has to make to come over here, state of his injury, uh, it was uh, always a difficult decision but Harry's not coming. Even the captain is surprised by the announcement. First of all, it's news to me. <laughs> um, well, Harry, of course, is a big loss to the squad. Um, he brings a completely different dimension to our team. He's got great flair and 
and great hunger to want to succeed. Um, so of course he's a loss but there is a great talent and depth in our squad now and I think as a result Unfortunately, his loss will be someone else's gain. The squad is boosted by the return of a familiar face with veteran defender and former Qantas Socceroos captain Craig Moore lured out of international retirement. You know, seeing top-notch football, uh, and that, you know, that was something that I missed and I felt why I was, I was still uh, feeling good and had my fitness that um, you know, I'd make myself available. At an open training session on the Gold Coast, the squad receives a hero's welcome. Another major bonus for the squad is the return of 2006 World Cup hero Tim Cahill after a lengthy absence from the game due to a foot injury. Uh, this is what we live for. Um, I think it always gives you goosebumps uh, to come home and play, uh, play in Australia. And, you know, being a Sydney boy, it's, it's fantastic. We're coming up to the Suncorp. We, you know, we, we've had some good times here and it's, you know, we always get excited. And then coming over here, he always wants to be here, uh, be in Australia, meet the people, meet his fans and be with the players and uh, play for the Socceroos. So Tim is, uh, is fantastic that he's back. Match day arrives. There are tactics and game plans to discuss and the team takes a walk on a beautiful morning in the Queensland capital. Captain Lucas Neal is quietly confident the boys can get the job done. We start fast, hopefully we can get off the same start we got off to in Melbourne get a couple of goals early and make it a comfortable night, but we know it's not going to be that easy. Prior to kick off, the heavens open and there's speculation that the match could be postponed. After a 30 minute delay and much deliberation from the match officials, the players finally take the pitch with the winner guaranteed a place at the top of Group A. The Saudi official gets us underway with the Green and gold play from left to right. The Qantas Socceroos start strongly and are rewarded after just nine minutes. Wilkshire, Carney in space. Towards Kennedy, helps it on. Cahill! He always delivers on the big occasion. He's back and he's scored for Australia. It's Cahill's 14th goal in just 29 appearances in the green and gold and the star midfielder is instrumental in the second goal eight minutes later. Towards Cahill, Qatar failed to clear their lines, Cahill is dragged down and it is a penalty kick. It's a stupid foul, the ball was dropping, Cahill's about to pull the trigger. Tim Cahill has scored the first, has he created the chance for Brett Emerton to perhaps finish the game off? Oh, and the keeper nearly got to it, but Brett Emerton scores Australia's second. And the Australian supporters are on their feet once more. Qatar has a rare opportunity close to half-time, but can't convert. The ball, Majid Mohamed, Qatar's best moments of the game. The end of a very, very comfortable first half for Australia. Tim Cale on his return to the national team after eight months out through injury with the opening goal after eight minutes. He then won the penalty after 17, which was converted by Brett Emerton. One of the highlights of the second half is the acrobatic skills of the Qatar keeper, who almost receives a perfect 10 from the judges. This uh, Wilkshire's delivery. Dive for the cameras from uh, Abdulaziz Ali. Here he goes. Way. Oh, that's a Klinsman. That's a Jurgen Klinsman. It's a case of deja vu for Brett Emerton, who scores another double against the Maroons. Brett Emerton, who drives it across goal. Two for Brett Emerton, three for Australia, three points for Australia, and what a clinical finish. It's the perfect strike from that angle. Low and hard across the keeper, you've always got a chance. And that is a man at the top of his game. After playing no part in the win over Uzbekistan, Josh Kennedy puts in a man of the match performance, scoring his sixth goal in just 10 appearances for the national team. Good applause from the home faithful up towards Kennedy. Keepers go. Josh Kennedy does have his goal. And Australia have four. The icing on the cake.
for big Josh Kennedy. Why the goalkeeper comes there, I have no idea. That's he has the no question chance. I was going to ask And the you. thing is, he should know how good Kennedy is in the air by now. He stands his ground there. It's very difficult to score. Oh, but they don't want to try. But... For Qatar, it's a night to forget. Now, Kalfan Ibrahim in behind. Oh! Well, that just sums up Qatar's night. Well, that's it. It's uh, all over. Australia dominant from start to finish. They take another giant leap towards South Africa by inflicting a third World Cup qualifying defeat upon Qatar. Himbebank's confident prediction that his team would win. No idle boast. The emphatic victory catapults the Qantas Socceroos to the top of the group. For Tim Cahill, it's the perfect return to international football. The biggest thing for me is to come back with a bang, you know, goals are important for, for my game. It rewards me for, for my starting position and uh, it rewards the manager and the players because um, they look for, for, for people like myself and, you know, Lucas to be leaders and, and that's what I hope I did tonight. Thoughts immediately turn to the next stage of qualifying. We've got Bahrain, we're going to uh, prepare right, be very disciplined and, and hopefully show another great result on the pitch again. But, you know, a lot of players did very well tonight and we, we should take great credit from it. For the first time since 2004, the Socceroos win four consecutive matches and are full of confidence as the journey to 2010 continues in the Kingdom of Bahrain. Two senior Socceroos are the first to arrive in Manama. Someone who won't be joining the squad is Craig Moore with the announcement that he will undergo immediate surgery for cancer in a Gold Coast hospital. The boys pay special tribute to their teammate. He's got to realise that all the boys are well and truly behind him. Um, yeah, we're all sending out plenty of love and uh, we're wishing them a, a speedy recovery. A tight turnaround between domestic league schedules results in a limited preparation for the group leaders and though Bahrain are yet to win in the final stage of qualifying, the team known as the Red Wolves will be desperate to keep its World Cup hopes alive. It's clear early in the match that the Socceroos face an enormous challenge and after just nine minutes, Mark Schwarzer and Lucas Neal combine to deny the home side. Here come the Bahrainis and Schwarzer beats that shot away from Abdullah Fatai. Bahrain's best chance comes just ten minutes later. Up against Lucas Neal and Valeri, he's got away from both of them and JC John forces another fine stop out of Mark Schwarzer. He's so strong, so powerful. Well, he's strong and he's quick as well. For the first time in the qualifying campaign, the manager has a look of genuine concern. A worried look on the face of uh, Pimba Bake, and perhaps rightly so. Jason Kalina lets his teammates know exactly how he feels about the lethargic first half performance. Kalina inside the centre circle. He's asking for options. He wants a bit of movement, in particular from Harry Kuehl. The Green and Gold Army is finally given some hope, close to half-time. Very happy with the home team's performance so far. Oh, and a header by Harry Kuehl flashes wide of the post. That's Australia's first real chance. Harry Kuehl shows touches of brilliance. by Kalina, beautifully done by Kuehl. Carney onside. But it's Bahrain who looks most likely to open the scoring. Enforcement's arriving now, across the face again, and Schwarzer at full stretch. Great run, a great positive run. Past Harry Kuehl, they've given the ball away in the half. They've got nothing to show for it. That's the positive point for Australia. Yep, half-time in Manama, Bahrain with all the best opportunities. Australia have struggled. Is the man who's caused most of the problems in the first half. After the break, the home side plays some inspired football and creates another chance. Oh, a mistake has let in Salman Issa with the shot. It's wide of the target, but yet another warning shot across the bounds well, of Australia. Well, luckily for Australia, it takes the wrong option. Close to the hour mark, the Socceroos have a rare opportunity inside the six-yard box. Kennedy retreats. Not much space to work with, in towards David Carney, side netting. Brilliant Nigerian-born striker JC John Issa. is a constant threat. Great ball but fails to convert John midway to the half. Golden opportunity, but couldn't take it. A bit of... Oh, I'm not even going to give him that. 
That's a 100% chance he should be burying that. It's a great ball in for once. It's a shot of Mark Schwartz. There we go. Pimberbag immediately James goes to his bench. Chris Coyne makes way. And uh, Jade North winning his 23rd cap is his replacement. Australia going to make that second change, and it is Brett Holman coming on. And it is Robbie. And Harry Kuehl coming off. The second change comes just two minutes later. Could have been any one of those three. And it really just hasn't happened. No, not been Harry's night tonight. Bahrain's final substitute almost breaks the deadlock with two minutes remaining. A goal intact as well. They've come mighty close tonight. Oh, they might still do. Oh, it's just wide of the target from the substitute, Al Dakil. In that little, this time was the inside right channel. Just a little ball back and Al Dakil just turning. It was a back heel from JC John. Never had the body shape to hit it in the first place. Oh, now a mistake and Bresciano's in. Could he nick the points for Australia? He can! Would you believe it? A goal against all the odds, and Mark Bresciano has won the game for Australia. And you have to say, they do not deserve it. That is cruel on Bahrain. In the dying moments of time added on, the Socceroos snatch a remarkable victory. Chance after chance, but the Iranian referee confirms a very unlikely victory for Australia. The boos ring out from the home supporters. Bahrain are perhaps now out of contention in the World Cup qualifiers. Australia, against all the odds, make it nine points out of nine. And South Africa is starting to loom large on the horizon. Final scoreline in Manama. While the Socceroos remain at the top of the group, Captain Lucas Neal is at a loss to explain the lacklustre performance. To be honest, we, we didn't really find any solutions to the problems tonight and uh, as a result we, we just had to grind it out. So great testament to our character for just being able to stay mentally strong. But for them, you know, we feel a little bit unlucky, a little bit embarrassed to have won the game the way we did. But, you know, that's football and I've been on the end of that before. Bresciano's in, could he nick the points? Japan defeating Qatar 3-0 in Doha sets up an epic showdown with the Blue Samurai in February. Uh, we're both going to pull away from the rest of the group and, and that's going to be an interesting game. I think uh, it'll be pretty much winner takes all in that one and if we both share the spoils, then um, you know we're both that, that much closer. But Pim Verbeek has a blunt message for his squad. We've had better uh, preparations, of course, but still, if you see the team we had on the pitch, the experience, international experience, the quality, then we should have done, uh, we should have done better than today. But I think my players know that also. Coming up, former national captain Alex Tobin explains what it means for Australian football if the Socceroos qualify for consecutive World Cups. Sporting greats gather in Sydney to support communities affected by devastating floods and bushfires. Coach Pim Verbeek talks about the shortfalls of limited preparation time. Since Australia's surprise 2-0 win over Japan in the 1956 Melbourne Olympics, a fierce rivalry has developed between the two nations, culminating in a 3-1 classic victory for the Socceroos in Kaiserslautern in the 2006 World Cup. In Yokohama, in front of 70,000 fans, the Socceroos face their greatest challenge on the road to South Africa. We know everything about Japan. We saw all the games. We know all the players. We, we know all the systems they can play. So we did everything to prepare ourselves. Pre-match, the mind games continue with a reminder that Japan can't afford to lose. We should not forget that the pressure is completely on Japan. Uh, we like to win. We don't have to win. And that's a big difference, of course. Underway at the stadium where Brazil won the World Cup in 2002. Please half. Japan remains undefeated in home World Cup qualifiers for over a decade and goes close to scoring after just four minutes. And it's hit to the side netting. And it's a little clever ball into the near post. He gets a toe on it. I think that comes off the foot of Schwarzer. That's a save on his near post.
Nakamura creates numerous opportunities with his lethal left foot, but the home side can't find the back of the net. Tamada coming in. They should say broke the line and towards Holman. Now it's Tim Cahill, and he'll go for goal. Cahill stuns the palms of Suzuki. In the second half, Japan's attack is relentless. Desperate defence and superb keeping from Mark Schwarzer keep the Socceroos in the contest. Well, there's a serious chance. Pimba Bate doesn't look too concerned. Nakatomo, chance to measure the cross. It's a good one to him. Tamada arriving on the edge of the box. Beautiful ball in from Nakatomo. Maybe leaning back slightly, but got in between Greg Moore and Chipperfield. And the pace on that. Cahill off, big Josh Kennedy on. A tough night at the office for Tim Cahill. <laughs> Worked so hard across that front line. Uchida is wide right as ever. Pass through bodies in the middle, and the volley, and deflected just wide on the edge of the six-yard box, would you believe it? It was a sweeping move from Japan. Uchida with the ball into the box, so lining up at the back post. Well, they've got the same boots on him now. He can get a decent centre in, there are three Australians waiting. Up towards Josh Kennedy who went for it. And the referee blows the full-time whistle. And it's a hard-earned point for Australia. Takeshi Okada will be under even more pressure. The Socceroos secure a precious point and are yet to concede a goal after more than six hours of football. The most capped Socceroo of all time, Alex Tobin, says a result away from home was more important than playing entertaining football. It was a good performance, good defensive performance. Obviously the result was uh, you know, a great result for the country. Um, uh, went into the game, I think, looking for a draw and, and got a draw. I, I think uh, perhaps you know, didn't create as many chances as you know, some people would have liked to have seen. But uh, from my point of view, uh, you know, I think the, the game plan was, was stuck to and uh, you know, they got a, a point, a very important point against a very good uh, team away from home and uh, set us on a very good standing for the World Cup. For veteran defender Craig Moore, the match went according to plan. For me there was no real surprises uh, about the Japan national team. That Technically they're very good, um, they can run all day, um, they move the ball extremely well. Probably a team that doesn't uh, penetrate um, as much as, as maybe what, what we could do, uh, especially uh, in, in home games. You know, they, a lot of their football is very nice on the eye and they tend to play in front of you. Uh, and fortunately that was the case um, in Japan. After undergoing surgery and missing the match against Bahrain, the 33-year-old former captain is simply glad to be back. To come back and to, to play in front of the, those sort of crowds in Japan, um, you know, that, that's the reason that brought me back to international football. It was something that I really, really missed and to go over there and play uh, in front of such a passionate crowd uh, and what was a very important game for the Australian national team it was really nice to be back involved again. Goalkeeping coach Tony Franken pays special tribute to Mark Schwarzer after another superb performance. Mark, over, over really the whole campaign so far, um, when called upon, has made that crucial save which has either got us the point or got us the three points. So I think Mark is very instrumental in us keeping clean sheets over the last, uh, in this last qualifying campaign. We just couldn't believe it. I mean, the, the stories that were, were happening, we didn't think they were true half the time. Your heart just goes out to them and this is probably the closest thing that we can do is to, is to raise something to, to help the families that, that need it. Devastating floods in far north Queensland and bushfires in Victoria sent a shudder through the nation. After a moving minute silence in Japan, Lucas Neal, Mark Schwarzer and Tim Cahill were determined to help. You know, the three of us on the way back on the plane to, to, to London came up with the idea of actually holding an event and thought we could make something very, very special that, you know, that hopefully can raise a hell of a lot of money for, you know, for the people that suffered so much. Obviously, you know, knowing Tim Cahill pretty well and the boys, so I uh, asked him to come down and definitely jumped at the opportunity to help Australia, so that's why I'm here tonight. Uh, good call from uh, Mark Schwarzer, so, you know, very happy to come along. I think it's great what the guys are doing, you know, putting it all on themselves and uh, very keen to, to get involved. Who would have thought that you get 50,000 to a soccer game in Australia? And who would have thought that three Australian players organising a function like this 
it would be a stellar and gala night simply because of who they are and what they've done. So the game has come a long, long way. The end result was just under half a million dollars raised. Coach Pim Verbeek comments on having adequate time to prepare ahead of a match. First of all, you can see if they are really ready to play that game. You can see on the field, on the training field, if they are fit, if they are mentally fit, uh, what kind of system is the best to, uh, to win that game, which you can't do when you have them just 48 hours in front because you just have to be happy that they are in the camp and that they are fit and then you just hope that they do uh, the same like they normally do, what they can do. That's one. And second, um, yeah, you like to prepare your team tactically. Players come from all over Europe. They play different kind of systems, different way of football. And then as a coach, you want to prepare them for the way they, uh, they have to play against uh, whatever opponent. Conditioning coach Darren Burgess has a tough task before some of the most important games for Australia. When we do play away, we often only have a two or three days to prepare them for games and often they come from different time zones, which is very important because often we'll have to play at 2am in European time, even though that might be 7pm in, in Japanese time. Most of these players will play on a Saturday or a Sunday, then they'll travel, for example, to Japan for a Wednesday game, arrive there on a Tuesday, we can't possibly expect them to be performing at their absolute maximum in that time. So definitely things like reaction time, acceleration, speed, uh, often decision making are compromised in that time. So it's up to us to try and uh, minimise that, that decrease in those, those facilities during that time. <laughs> After a hard-fought 1-0 win in Tashkent last September, the Socceroos have enormous respect for Uzbekistan and the team known as the White Wolves is full of confidence following a 4-0 win against Qatar. 22-year-old Farhad Tajiev is the hero with a hat-trick in just his fourth appearance at national level. Pimba Bake has some surprise selections with Scott McDonald up front and elaborates on his decision to start with Richard Garcia. I think he plays very well in the training. He had uh, one of the best trainings I've seen from him from, uh, from the last months. And uh, he's playing a lot of games at the moment in England. He's powerful, he has uh, a good right foot, he can score goals. And I have a lot of confidence uh, that he can do the job today. With Craig Moore failing to recover from injury after the match against Kuwait, Michael Beecham is named alongside captain Lucas Neal. Australia get the ball rolling for the match which may well decide their World Cup fate. Listen to the roar around Stadium Australia. Playing its second game in five days, Uzbekistan shows no signs of fatigue and is on top early. Danger again, the cutback and the shot from Tojiev, he just didn't get onto it. There's a warning sign for the Socceroos. Good spell this from Uzbekistan, Jeparov feeds it through, no flag, it's Kapate with the shot across the face of goal. Twice in a matter of moments, in fact, it was Tojiev. Fahad Tojiev, the hat-trick hero from last weekend, likes the service. Well, it's the second chance. So he gets in behind Beecham. He's level, but he's on his own. He has to take the shot. It's a low and hard across the keeper. It's the right idea from this man in form, Tojiev. After a failed clearance, the Socceroos have a golden chance to open the scoring. The stake by the Uzbeks. McDonald's in there. Preciano, Mark Preciano! Well, he's picked out the goalkeeper. What a chance for Australia. There's Pim for Bake. Great play from Scott McDonald. Plays it instantaneously to Bresciani's first touch is superb. Sets it up beautifully for him. From that moment, you're just expecting to see the net bowls. Close under it. Wilkshire was watchful. And Garcia has been cut down unceremoniously by his opposite number. The visitors look dangerous from the set piece. In it comes from Jeparov, it's a great delivery as well, but superb defending from Scott Chipperfield. The Socceroos' next strike is from long range. Kalina. Mailov, not a very convincing clearance, chest sits up nicely for him. A foul by Carl Valeri Jeparov. gives Uzbekistan another opportunity. Another free kick for Uzbekistan. 
similar delivery from Jeparov and Schwartz are relieved to see that one land in the breadbasket. Luke Wilkshire will pay a heavy price for this late tackle. Wilkshire's lunged in, Jeriah has gone down and that's a yellow card for Luke Wilkshire. Well, Luke Wilkshire. And that will sideline him for Australia's next World Cup qualifier. Suggests that he did catch him. Oh, when he did. Ooh. That's a dangerous challenge. After a scoreless Pimba opening Bates half, the look the on the face of Pimba Bakes says it all. Doesn't look like a happy coaching bench, that one. Well, so far, so good for Uzbekistan, but not so for Australia. Mark Bresciano with a golden opportunity to put the Socceroos in front, but they have plenty of work to do. The Socceroos lineup remains unchanged at the start of the second half, but the home fans make it clear who they'd like to see. But listen to the roar. Captain Lucas Neal is next to go in the referee's notebook. It's compacted in and around the penalty box to try and get it wide. Well, Neil and Todgy have had tussled and a yellow card for the Australian captain. With the game starting to open up, both teams create chances. Good layout from McDonald. Space now for Garcia. He's trying to pick out Kuehl. Kuehl with the volley. And the ball here from Garcia floated to the back post to Harry Kuehl. Takes it on the volley. Hasanov whips it in. Oh, how close was that? Beautiful play. So it's good defending. Go up to the other end. Kapati with a brilliant layoff to Todger. A brilliant save from the Uzbekistan keeper denies the Socceroos. Here's a chance for Kalina! What a save, Nesterov! What a moment for Jason Kalina! From Jason Kalina. Carl Valeri coming across the box. He takes it first time. And that was a world-class save from Nesterov, who's not had a lot to do. He punches it over, was hit with a lot of pace and power. On the hour mark, Pimba Bake makes his first change. Australia. One striker replaced by another. But there's a pretty big size difference, and that's why Kennedy is going to come on before the free kick is taken. Australia's At 194 centimetres, Josh there. Kennedy is the perfect off. target man up front, and he has an immediate impact. In the first man, Kennedy! from Josh Kennedy. The pace is on the cross, he just has to direct it. Normally he'd go across the keeper, but he goes to the near post. Bresciano gets his head up. He just directs it, the pace is on the cross, and a beach nester of at the near post. And that's what it means to Pim Verveig, that's what it means to the fans at Stadium Australia, the most important goal. After a clumsy challenge, the Socceroos are given a chance to double their lead. With a chance from the spot, Richard Garcia has won the penalty. It's a stupid challenge. It's cut it's him off. Carry him off. The ball's gone. He's, he's not going to get that. The Australians, more importantly, what this does mean, will put the game, you would think, beyond reach of the Uzbekistan. Kill against Nesterov. Australia 2-0, the World Cup beckons. Well, very nonchalant, the penalty from Harry Kuehl. Little emotion as it goes in, but plenty of emotion in the stadium. Kuehl, as you like, goes the right way, Nestor, but there's too much pace on it. He hits it too well. With three points almost secured, one of Australia's best is given an early ninth. In the final moments of time added on, Uzbekistan almost Chance find a consolation goal. Schwarzer with the first save, offside, no goal for Soliev. Spasciano played that one back. They want to sling it in the box, maybe get a third goal before the end of the game, but it wasn't to be. It's mission accomplished for Australia. The Socceroos surely are on their way to the World Cup. What a night for the players. What a night for Pimver, but what a night to remember. The dream is all but a reality, and there's three games to spare. Full-time here at Stadium Australia is Australia 2, Uzbekistan 0. Post-match, Pimba Bake reviews the Socceroos' performance.
Ah, the first 10, 15 minutes, they were very dangerous. They had some, uh, some very good attacks, so they made us a little bit scared. I think because of that, the first half we played uh, too slow tempo. We were a little bit afraid to go, uh, to go full, and at half time we, uh, we spoke with the boys and we said, look, you can't do this, we have to win the game, we go for it. And we um, have to play the ball faster and put them under pressure, and the goal will come, the chances will come. And exactly that happened. The longest serving Socceroo of all time, Mark Schwarzer, is relieved to be one step closer to South Africa. Um, things didn't go to plan, I suppose, in the first half. We, we really didn't have the intensity we would have liked. Uh, but second half, you know, we, we came out and, and uh, we played how we should have played in the first half. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about results. Um, and, and, you know, we're, 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 you know, we're almost there, and that's the main thing. With a record-breaking five clean sheets in World Cup qualifiers, the Socceroos comfortably lead the group and only need a draw from their clash against Qatar in June to book their place on football's biggest stage. There's uh, Pim Verbeek. He says World Cup qualification would be the finest achievement of his career. He's just 90 minutes away from achieving that. Kuehl with time to measure the cross. Up goes Josh Kennedy. Well, he didn't quite get the direction. And now Ali Afif. Again, they're looking to hit Sebastian Quintana early. And they found him in space. And Quintana lashes it wide. Oh, Qatar have got a wall of two. I didn't think Bresciano would shoot from here. Kennedy flicks it on. In behind. Off the woodwork by Kuehl. Kale. Beautifully arced run. Kennedy. Missed it. Here's Kuehl, who's got it behind. Little slip by Ibrahim Maji. Kuehl still going and toes it towards goal, and then I think it rebounded back off his shins and over the top for a goal kick. Now, now Kuehl in space. Shapes to cross with the left. That's twice he's got him behind. Qatar reeling here, and then Carl Valeri's drive takes a touch and just over the top. Again, Bilal Mohamed, Ibrahim Maji thrown forward. Oh, and a real chance here, and it's raised over the top by Quintana. Took a touch again, though. They've got a corner to defend here. Cristiano clips it in. Back into the danger zone, and then cleared off the line by a Qatari defender. And here's Tim KL. Stings the palms of Kazim Burhan. That was Australia's best moment. Well, certainly in the second half. KL, of course, hit the post in the first. Oh, that one would have counted though. And they stay hit when Timmy Kyle gets behind one. Good save. Mission accomplished. Back-to-back -back World Cups for Australia. Get out your travel maps. Check the exchange rate for the Rand. The Socceroos are off to join the world's biggest party. South Africa, here they come. As an individual, what does this mean to Pim Verbeek? No, I think a World Cup is the, the highest possible tournament uh, for, for every coach, for every player. So I've been there two times as the assistant coach. I know how it is. And it's a great, great event. And we're already looking forward to go there. And uh, that's all the players want. The point earned in Doha was enough to clinch one of the top two places in Group 1 of Asian qualifying and, of course, a berth in South Africa. With the job done against Qatar, the Qantas Socceroos have a short turnaround for the match against Bahrain in Sydney, so the recovery process starts straight away. After failing to find the back of the net in Doha, the boys promised to deliver against Bahrain at Stadium Australia, whilst also chasing their seventh straight clean sheet. It's good pressure that by Bahrain, but Australia still have the ball through Holman, through for Scott McDonald! Oh, surely that was the moment, no offside flag. And he's blazed wildly over, the goal just won't come for the Celtic striker. Could have taken another touch, good play from Brett Holman. Maybe he thought about taking the shot, but from that distance, we can see he probably could have taken a touch and slotted it home, but he hits it on the up. Not great technique. He scored a lot of goals from, for Celtic in similar positions. Intelligent pass by Kuehl. Carney's centre, it's a good one, and headed towards goal and downwards by Slajowski. A decent chance. Ash retrieves it. Now, Abdullah Abdi. Behind briefly, Salman Issa. Oh, he goes for goal from a very narrow angle. That's a super effort from the number 14 for Bahrain. That's a wonderful strike. Certainly had Schwarzer worried. Coming to the box. Abdullah Abdi, clever little ball back. 
And look at that, he unleashes the left foot. Julian looking for Stachowski. Miller Stachowski breaks the deadlock for Australia. A year's pent up frustration and a lack of game time in England is released in a moment's joy for Mile Stajowski. Well, for once they get in behind, and it's Harry Kuehl that gets in behind. Plays a first-time ball, and Stajowski comes off the right-hand side, as he should. Your right, right-sided midfielder must come in when that ball is a mistake there, and he pounces onto it, left foot past Sayed Jaffa. Clever little ball there. Aish makes the mistake, and Stajowski pounces. Kills one in, oh, and it's a goal for Bahrain, but the flag's up against Abdullah al Marzuki and the celebrations are cut short on the Bahraini bench. Wicked ball in. Sensing that the time has come to gamble. Need a point from this encounter. Yorkshire changing the angle, it's back across goal, and glanced over the line, was it, by Kuehl, and then towards goal by Stachowski, and Australia can't force the ball over the line. Good possession play by the Socceroos, Wilkshire, Kalina, Carl. Drop for David Carney. Oh, the spectacular overhead comes back off the woodwork, and it's forced home by David Carney. And that's the points, signed, sealed and delivered for Australia. Well, David Carney gets the reward following in as it comes back off the post. And I think they deserve a second goal. Look at that. Great technique from Kalina. Beautiful bicycle kick. So unlucky it comes back off the post. Had Say Jaffa beaten all ends up. But Carney gets the rewards for following in, being the first to react and sticks at home and seals up the game for Australia. Uh, we have to break them down. We have to take our time. But eventually we got that goal that we needed. Now you guys obviously had the really short turnaround and it showed a little bit. Are you feeling pretty tired? Ah, uh, yeah, of course. I think all the boys are feeling a little bit tired, but this is where it counts. This is uh, not the only team travelling in this day and age, so we have to get out there and we have to be super fit for that. Uh, Dave, congratulations on your goal tonight. Uh, certainly worked hard for it and got it very late. Yeah, I don't often get up the park to score goals from left back, but uh, you know, I just followed in. It was a great overhead kick from Jason. We just followed in. It's one of those. It's either comes to you or don't, but luckily it comes to me. We're all extremely proud. I'm, I'm extremely proud of the way uh, the whole team, the whole, you know, the management have, have gone about uh, their job. And from day one, we've been so professional. And, you know, to, to be so far in the qualification with two games to go and, and, and be assured in the, to be a place in the World Cup, I think is an unbelievable achievement. I think it, it's something that, uh, for us, it, if anything, it has a little bit more of a sense of uh, accomplishment from the, from the last one. 2006 World Cup defender Tony Popovich says the team handled the extensive travel throughout the campaign superbly, making the most of qualifying through Asia. Yeah, going to China, going to Qatar, uh, on paper it looks like, you know, they're, they're three points there for the taking, but, you know, you've got to go to play there in difficult conditions. Uh, players arriving on a Monday to play on a Tuesday or Wednesday from Europe, um, you know, they're, they're serious problems that, um, that Australia would have been faced with and the coaches would have had dilemmas on are the players fit, are they not and um, they did a fantastic job in um, getting the points required away from home and we were always strong at home. We asked Popper who should partner Lucas Neal at the World Cup finals in the centre of defence. Yeah there's obviously probably three, four, five players that believe they can definitely play there with Lucas. Um, can't forget Craig Moore as well who uh, missed the uh, recent matches but has done well since he's come back. So, um, you yeah, know, with his experience and, and Lucas's from the last campaign, maybe that's an option. And as one of Australia's greatest defenders, Alex Tobin says to not concede a goal in seven matches was phenomenal. I think it was a, a fantastic run, uh, a lot of games um, to have you know, not conceded a goal until the last game against Japan was uh, a fantastic defensive display. But uh, overall, they, they made it easily. And, uh, you know, with two games to spare, there's not many countries in the world who can claim that. John Aloisi played a pivotal role in one of Australia's finest sporting moments. Trailing 1-0, the Socceroos scored three goals in eight minutes to defeat the Blue Samurai in Kaiserslautern. The Sydney FC striker described scoring at a World Cup as one of the highlights of his career. And despite not playing a role in this qualifying round, he would dearly love another chance on the big stage. 
once the season starts, hopefully I'll be flying and scoring goals. And if I'm doing that, you never know what's around the corner. Um, that's up to Pim at the end if he thinks uh, he needs someone like myself or needs someone else. But if I'm doing well, that's all I can do. The Socceroos can cement their place as Asia's number one team with a draw all better in the final qualifying match on the hallowed turf at the MCG. With 55 appearances and 27 goals for the national team, Aloisi says Japan simply can't handle the aerial supremacy of the Socceroos. If it's Viduka or Josh Kennedy or whoever, uh, we've got other players to come through that, like Timmy. He comes uh, deep and from late and um, it's difficult to handle and, and I think that's why they, they struggle against that, the, the Japanese. Lucas Neal is quick to dismiss talk of the match being a dead rubber, despite facing a Japanese team without superstars Shunsuke Nakamura and Yasuhito Endo. It's extremely important. It's for one, it's for Australian pride. It's for the pride of Asia as well. We want to see who's the top dog in Asia and we certainly want to assert our authority there. Since Australia's first international in 1922, over 500 players have proudly worn the green and gold and the night has special significance for the Socceroos captain. Yep, I think it's a perfect way for me to end my, uh, my time in the World Cup campaign so far. Uh, 50 games, going to the World Cup in front of a huge Melbourne crowd. I know it's going to be a great reception and it's a game that I hope and I think we will win. from Cahill, enough to make the goalkeeper scramble across. <laughs> Japan have scored through Tulio Tanaka, the first goal against Australia in this final round of World Cup qualification. Would you believe it? And past the disbelieving Mark Schwarzer. in behind, perfect timing, as I said, not a lot of power, but in that direction. Work by Kennedy, Kalina, Australia starting to threaten, Nick Carl drives it through, and it's tip wide, it'll be a corner, into the final quarter of an hour, Carl with the corner, oh and it's gone in, Australia have a second goal, and it's Timmy Cahill again, two goals like in Germany 2006, he punches the corner flag, we could be in Kaiserslautern, a lot of players don't gamble, they don't anticipate. What KL has is anticipation, and what it gives him is a second goal. Nicky Carl, a difficult match, I would say. He's a big favourite amongst the fans. The MCG rises as one to applaud. Oh, people question now. Their golden boy in the green and gold. And the final whistle goes. 
Australia, who claim victory thanks to two Timmy Cahill goals. The Socceroos' dominance in qualifying is reflected on the points table with just one goal conceded in over 12 hours of football. Post-match discussion turns to just who will be on the plane to South Africa. Well, look, there's 23 spots and there's about 35 people vying for them, so it's going to be tough. It's great for competition and uh, whoever goes, we're going to have great depth in squads. So good luck to everyone involved and hope we stay injury-free and see you all in South Africa. It would be amazing, you know. I think that's, that's my long-term goal, but they're still... Still a year away, you know, it's, it's making sure I do well with my club, making sure if I do get call-ups call during the year, it is doing as best I can, I'm being as professional as I can. Um, so fingers crossed, but that, that, that would be amazing. I, I don't think there's no bigger um, dream for any footballer. You know, just as long as I keep working hard, plugging away, if I get my opportunity, then, you know, um, hopefully Pim can see that. And, you know, th there's a long time to go to the World Cup and, you know, there's players like Craig Moore still to, still to come back and, you know, i just got to keep on working hard. It will be tough, but that's, uh, that's, that's great for a coach to have uh, that kind of problems. So I will not have a headache um, for that I don't know which players to select. I have a, a great choice of players and that's, I think, uh, the biggest advantage from the last 18 months that so many players uh, put their hands up and say, OK, here I am. And uh, all of them did very well. Such a great move by Frank, Frank Lowy and Ben Buckley and the FFA to, to move into Asia. Much tougher competition, uh, much more challenges and uh, we showed that you know, with the way we had to prepare maybe a day before a game, 22 hours to Australia before a game and uh, look, I just think that it's going to raise the level of performance for Australia you know, consistently now for a number of years and uh, to say that we're top of Asia, which is a huge region, it's like almost two thirds of the world's population, is just it's an amazing, proud feeling, and now we go into the World Cup with great confidence and a team that can be picked from out of about 35 players, which is great strength and depth. Whatever chance, whatever opportunity you can get in the side, you, you want to take it. Um, we've got some brilliant players, obviously, anywhere in that front third, so um, wherever you get a chance, you want to do as best you can. Um, Tim here, the likes of Timmy Carhill, Brett Holman, Harry, Bresh, Jay, they can all play in that position. Um, that I like to play in, so regardless where you get a chance, you've you got to do your best, you know, and Pim spoke to me and said, um, I'm going to play you out there, you know, and, and I was more than happy to do whatever the coach needed for, for the team. Uh, if we can all stay fit and healthy and, you know, get the next games under our belts all together and, and you know, even bond more as a group, then I think uh, we'll do quite well. This is the only sport in Australia that is played all around the world and so it's just massive for us. The game's just going to keep on growing. You know, in 2006, suddenly you know, thousands of extra kids registered because of the, the Socceroos going to the World Cup that year. Uh, I'm sure the, the same will happen again next year. Uh, because people all of a sudden realise how big this game is and, and everybody will want to be a footballer.